So we have got uh, day seven here of special pops. This is gonna be our last lecture. Uh, it's another one where we've only got two populations today, so not um, a ton of stuff to get through. But we are gonna be talking about how to deal with people who have come back, uh, sort of, you know, after dealing with um, any of the various different types of cancers. So. Um, you're definitely going to have plenty of clients, you know, go through remission and then they're going to want to get physically active and stuff. Um, but unfortunately, the treatment for cancer is pretty brutal, um, you know, chemotherapy and things like that. And it does have some um, pretty intense uh, effects on our clients, like physiologically. So we just need to be aware of that so that we can kind of navigate it. Um, it's funny, it's not even necessarily the disease that really kind of knocks them out. It's really, it's, it's really the things associated with the treatment uh, that kind of make, make things a little bit rough. Um, and then we'll also be talking about chronic lung disease today, uh, which some of that could be cancer related, um, but oftentimes is uh, sort of its own bag. And you will notice that th that actually uh, is very, very different disease wise, but uh, also in a similar way, the treatment to, or I'm sorry, not the treatment, but the, <clears throat> the adjustments that we need to make to our workout programs is very, very, very similar. So that's why these two are sort of looped up, um, sort of similar, to, <laughs> sort of similar to dealing with like obesity and pregnancy. They are nothing alike, but the adjustments that we make are, uh, <laughs> so, um, Cancer, uh, by definition, is going to be any of the various types of malignant neoplasms that invade and surround tissues that begin to metastasize to several sites. So uh, that definition has kind of a lot of a lot of technical and a lot of technicality to it. Um, the way that I sort of summarize it when I'm talking about it is it's it's a group of non-functional but aggressive cells that keep our tissues from working, right? So it is definitely where like we get a very, um, uh, you know, a, a, a non-functioning group of cells. They don't do anything like physiologically for us. Um, in fact, they, they start to cover our tissues and then they keep those tissues from working. Um, so how do we end up like contracting this darn thing? You know, like what is, you know, sort of, well, there's a lot of different types of cancers. This is one of the reasons why one of the statistics we are going to see is that it is the second leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, if we look at like uh, causes of death in the U.S. Um, life expectancy of 78 years, not bad. Uh, let's see here. So we are seeing heart disease at the top with 659,000, but cancer is right behind it at six, uh, you know, 599,000. So... Uh, and then we see, look at this drastic drop down to like, you know, accidents and then like respiratory disease, stroke, which is totally related to heart disease, in my opinion. Uh, oftentimes, I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be, but Alzheimer's is taking, wow, Alzheimer's is one, two, three, four, five, sixth on the list. I find that very surprising, actually. And then diabetes, you know. Um, so anyway, um, uh what happens, how do we actually sort of contract, you know, cancer? How do we develop this, this condition, right? Because um, we've got a 44% probability in males and about 38% probability in females to develop some type of cancer at some point throughout our lifespan. That's, you know, it's close to a 50-50 chance, right? Um, and a lot of them are caught in time and taken care of, but, you know, how do we get this? Well, you know, a lot of times we, we, we like to point the finger to like chemicals and stuff as just a, a sort of all the time bad thing, right? And you guys know me, I'm pro chemical, you know, like I, I am, I totally appreciate, you know, uh, chemicals in my food, uh, if they make my food like healthier and make them last longer. Water is technically a chemical, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. That's what makes it a chemical. Um, but we are talking about chemicals that have um, things that are actually going to sort of affect our cells. So just to give you a really, hopefully, knowing me, uh, brief chemistry lesson here. If we look at like what a free radical is, right? Um, so you'll hear this term sometimes, you'll hear this term free radical, right? And that's, that's what's associated oftentimes with like a lot of different types of cancers. So if we talk about like, you know, just go into like very basic chemistry. Chemistry is all about how chemicals bond to one another, 
right? So it's all about how like, you know, you can take like a piece of sodium, which normally looks like this, you know, uh, looks like a chunk of rock. I'm sorry, a chunk of metal, I should say, right? There's a piece of like pure sodium, right? In its natural state. And if we look at like chloride, you know, if you look at it in its natural element, uh, it's often found in like soil and stuff. Uh, you know, you can see like little bits of it there. Um, there we go. Kind of looks like that in its natural state. Uh, and then if you take sodium and chloride and put them together, <laughs> you end up with this. Good old classic table salt. <laughs> uh, and that stuff is awesome. You put it on food and it's delicious. <laughs> so like, you know, um, this plus this binds together to make this stuff, right? Um, good old fashioned table salt. So that's what chemistry is. It's all about like how these different elements are sort of binding together. And they do it because every element has uh, like a nucleus in the center, which is made up of like several protons, right? So when you look at the periodic table, um, you know, it's, it's, it's periodic, which means that, you know, it kind of lays itself out uh, in very predictable ways. But we look at like, you know, you look at this, they each have a number, right? They have an atomic number. He, uh, hydrogen is number one. And then you look over here and you see helium is number two. Uh, and then you look back over here, lithium is number three, beryllium is four, right? And so it works its way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until eventually you get into these crazy ones down here, um, which, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you what some of those are. I know Californian is one of them. Uh, <laughs> those are all the like really rare or man-made elements. Yeah, there's the fun ones. Uh, Americesium, I think is how it's pronounced, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, then there's like plutonium and stuff like that. But you look at like these normal ones, like hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, and selenium, right? All these blue ones are very relevant to us as people. Um, also all these, like these blue ones here are really important to us. Like a lot of those are going to be found in our foods and stuff, right? So they each have a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, all the way up, right? And that number represents how many protons are going to be found in the center of uh, that molecule, right? So the protons are going to be here in the nucleus, right? And then there's going to be an even number of neutrons as well. Protons have a positive charge, neutrons are neutral. And then on the outside, we're going to have all these electrons. And electrons are, you know, when you look at an atom and you see like all the little things like swirling around the outside, those are your electrons. And those electrons are how the binding takes place. It's how elements like to, to come together. If we look at like an electron bond, uh, it's literally where like two elements that are separate from one another are like, you know, they're either going to straight up steal another person's, uh, another element's electrons, um, or in the case of like sodium chloride, uh, they're going to share one, right? And so like this little guy is going to come over here and he's going to fill this outer layer here. And now these two elements are going to live together. <laughs> they're they're going to be buddies, right? Because they're going to share an electron. Now, like I said, at its base set neutral level, the number of protons inside of an element are equal to the number of electrons, right? Um, but there's another way that electrons like to work, which is sort of separate from that, uh, which is there's going to be these different energy levels that you're going to find. That's why we always draw them like this, where it's like one, two, three energy levels, right? And there's space for two electrons in the first energy level, no matter what element we're talking about here, there's always space for two. So one, two, right? And then once that's filled, we're going to move out to the outer layer, right? So now we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight right? There's eight spaces in the outer or second energy layer, right? So first energy layer has two, second layer has eight. Third, I want to say has 16. Uh, how many? <laughs> I used to know this. Uh, <laughs> two, eight, 18, 18, and 32. There's not a, it's not a freaking pattern. Um, it's 16 plus two. That's how I used to remember that. Um, 
So anyway, uh, it's what I think it would be plus the first energy layer. That's how I used to keep that in my brain. Um, so that's two, eight, 18, and then 32 in the fourth energy layer. So naturally, electrons like to fill that outer energy layer. And the reason sodium and chloride get so well together is they like to have those layers kind of filled evenly, right? Well, sodium's got one electron in its outermost energy layer because sodium on the periodic table is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, uh, 11. If we look at sodium, right, on the periodic table, it should say, yep, it's number 11. Right, So it has 11 protons, which means it has 11 electrons. Two are going to go in the first energy layer. Eight are going to go in the second energy layer. Right, um, And that is going to leave this extra little electron here around the outside, because that would be 10. But this one's got 11. So this extra little guy, that's a very unfilled energy layer. Remember, there's room for 18 slots in this outer layer. So because of that, it wants to find something that it can bind to, to kind of share that last electron with, so that it sort of like fills up its energy layer. Well, chlorine over here is number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 on the periodic table. So it has one slot available here to get to 18 uh, where it can share that with sodium. And so sodium and chloride are constantly sharing electrons uh, and that's what attracts them to one another. So why are we talking about all this? Like, obviously, like this is a, a big, long explanation. Well, here's the thing. Um, that's how all elements bind together. They share electrons or maybe someone steals an electron from someone else, right? Um, and if it steals an electron, you know, usually the other one's going to be like attracted to it. You know, an, an element can donate or accept electrons or it can share, right? And that's how we form different types of bonds. Well, what would happen, do you think, what would happen if you had an element introduced into a system that is just constantly stealing electrons from all the other elements? It would make those other elements very unstable. Right, they wouldn't be they they wouldn't be happy little elements anymore, and they're probably going to go along and steal electrons from somewhere else. Now that doesn't really sound all that bad if it's happening far away from us, <laughs> right? But our bodies are made of trillions of atoms, right? Like we're we're made up of all of these chemicals all coming together. I mean, your water, you're you're, you're mostly water inside your body, which means you're mostly hydrogen inside of your body right um and so you know the atoms you know things like carbon and, and nitrogen and you know a little bit of oxygen all these like different things they all kind of come together and they make up your cells right those atoms make up your cells and then your cells make up your tissues and your tissues make up you so if you screw up if it well not if you screw up but if the atoms in your body get screwed up the cells inside your body get screwed up. Now, all of your cells contain information about how they are supposed to grow and how they are supposed to develop, right? That's what your DNA is. So your DNA is this blueprint. It's the how to build new Thomas stuff, right? It's, it's how to build new Eddie stuff, right? It's the blueprint instructions for, for how to make you. Now, what would happen if the atoms in that DNA got messed up and then the blueprint is now compromised right like somebody was in the foreman's office right and there's like a little picture of like you know how to build new eddie right like how to make new eddie stuff and then somebody just went over there and drew a mustache <laughs> like, <laughs> like graffitied on your blueprint you know what i mean <laughs> like be like you know this would be hilarious like bart simpson you know <laughs> like <laughs> Um, if something like that happened, the blueprint's compromised. And so it's going to make new cells. Cells are going to grow and develop, but they're not going to grow and develop the way that they're supposed to. You're going to get a non-functioning altered cell. That, if that happens with like a bunch of cells, and now you have a whole bunch of cells that are dividing like cells do, right? They, they divide and split their DNA and make new copies of themselves. So now you have like a, a derpy cell, and then that derpy cell makes a copy of itself, 
And then both of them make another copy. So you go from having one derpy cell to two derpy cells to four to eight to 16 to 32 to, you know, 64 to 128 cells. Now you're starting to get like a large mass of non functioning derpy cells. And that's actually what a tumor really is, right? Especially if it starts to like metastasize and kind of sit into your tissues and become sort of a permanent structure in you, right? It really starts to like ruin our cells. So that's sort of what a lot of different types of cancers are. Now, obviously there's, there's so many different types of cancers, right? Um, but uh, so why, why do we talk about like the chemistry? Like, again, how does this actually happen? Well, what a free radical is, is a free, here's like a stable molecule, right? See, see the orbital shells here and the electrons, right? So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. What's number 10 on the period, Tim? <laughs> uh, it's just before sodium. We know that much because we just looked it up. Uh, <laughs> man, college me would know. <laughs> Neon. Okay, uh, so neon, that's not even an important one for us, uh, but it is in our atmosphere. So neon, right? So this is a molecule of neon. Now take a look, someone stole an electron from the outside of that neon. So now this is an unstable molecule and it wants to fill its outer electron shell. So what's it gonna do? It's gonna pass it down the line, it's gonna steal from somebody else and make problems for something else. So if this unstable neon got into your body, it's going to steal electrons from somewhere. That somewhere is you, right? That, that, that surrounding universal stuff is now the stuff that makes up your body. So now that is how we get, you know, this is why we say like, oh, chemicals are bad for us and chemicals cause cancer. That's not an untrue statement. It doesn't mean that chemicals are bad. Um, but yes, like free radicals um, cause what we call oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is when a free radical actually damages our cells. You've actually seen this happen. You've seen oxidative stress actually plenty of times. If you've ever like, you know, seen like a fruit get really nasty slowly over time, or if you've ever like cut an apple and left it on the counter for five minutes and come back and it's like brown and you're like, come on, <laughs> right? Yeah. Avocado. Avocados. Out. Yeah, those are the worst. <laughs> Sometimes I always think like, I still think like, oh, no, nah, this is rotten. But my dad's like, nah, it's still good. It's just, you just, just remove that part and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what you're seeing is it has been attacked by like, you know, oxygen molecules are basically stripping its electrons. And so like it turns this kind of brownish, you know, nasty color, right? That's yeah. oxidative stress. So that's what's happening here. Like our cells, um, free radicals. I want to see the chemistry, please. Not that, not that, not that. Uh, there we go. Okay, well, this is actually an antioxidant. I, I will talk about that, but I'm just not quite there just yet. Okay, so this free radical, which is, <laughs> I love this. It says electron thief. This is very uh, clearly like a very overly simplified explanation, but I love it. I think it's great. <laughs> this little free radical thief here. We have a healthy atom and it's going to steal it, right? It's going to steal that electron. So now the free radical is happy, right? Um, but we don't care that if, if free radicals happen. We don't, you know, it's not part of us, right? Um, so how do we prevent this from happening, right? How do we prevent this? Well, obviously you could eat like, you know, perfectly organic foods forever. And like you could avoid overexposure to sunlight forever. And you could, you know, like live a perfect life. Um, but I don't know anybody who's ever actually pulled that off <laughs> um, in human history. <laughs> uh, so luckily, because of that, we do have ways that we can protect ourselves against free radicals. Uh, and that is what we refer to as an antioxidant. So you see that all the time on like, you know, juices and things like that that are being sold in stores. They're like, oh, it's got a lot of antioxidants in it, right? Um, and sometimes it sounds like marketing hype. You're like, well, what, what does that mean? What do you mean it has antioxidants in it? Well, what an antioxidant is, is it's actually sort of like a reverse free radical. Like free radicals are missing electrons. So they steal electrons from us, which damages our cells, which eventually leads our cells to making these imperfect copies of themselves. It leads to oxidative stress. Well, 
oxid uh, 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 antioxidants prevent oxidation. They prevent that oxidative stress because they basically have extra electrons and they're willing to donate them away to free radicals so that those free radicals don't steal electrons from us. They're like a human shield, <laughs> you know? Um, this is like the best way. I would love to make a video explaining this. Do you guys remember Austin Powers? I think it's number one. <laughs> Maybe it's number two. Do you remember that movie at all? I've seen all of them, but I'm not sure which one like is which at this point. <laughs> yeah, there's this like woman that just like won't die. Like she keeps like. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She, she falls keeps... off the cliff and she's like. You know, at that at that point, like it's like surely she's taken him out, and he just like grabs her and very slowly like moves her in front of him. Yeah, <laughs> like oh, that's kind of what uh, uh, antioxidants do for us. <laughs> like, that's hilarious. <laughs> they really kind of protect us. They they have these extra electrons um, that they're willing to donate away, right? And so what that does that stabilizes the free radical, right? So here you can see. Here's a free radical over here, which has this unpaired electron. And here's an antioxidant. It's like, I got lots of electrons here. I have a free one, you know? And now everybody's happy. And this molecule can no longer steal from our tissues. So this is why, like, they say, like, don't eat, um, you know, uh, don't microwave food in a plastic container. Right? You'll hear that all the time. Like, they'll say, like, oh, it causes cancer and stuff. Does it? Well, you know, plastics have a lot of chemicals in them. And unfortunately, they're the type of chemicals that your body really can't break down. Um, for the most part, if you get plastic into your body, you accidentally eat some plastic, right? Um, well, for the most part, it's gonna get into your body. It goes into your digestive system. Your digestive system's not really designed to absorb plastic. It doesn't have slots for plastic. It has slots for proteins, carbs, vitamins, minerals, water, right? Um, uh fats <laughs> i was like i was like that was only five i'm missing a, i'm missing a nutrient uh <laughs> um it's only got slots for those things but if that plastic sits around because it doesn't get out of your body either uh well it could start causing problems you know it can it can start becoming like a free radical where it's like it's electrons start stealing from their surrounding environment and because this little piece of plastic is embedded in your tissues it it starts stealing from you this is why smoking causes cancer, right? Uh, vaping causes cancer, right? Those things, like, they have a lot of chemicals in them. And so those chemicals get into your body. Your body doesn't really know how to deal with them. And so it just kind of puts them off to the side, which is what your body always does when it can't deal with something. It just kind of usually puts some fluid around it or puts it in a little sack um, and just kind of holds it there. And it's going to start, you know, doing its chemistry thing because uh, that's how everything in the universe works. So we want to make sure that like, it, you know, we have a diet that has plenty of like vitamins and minerals in it because, well, vitamins in particular, because that is one of the, what, what an antioxidant is. So if we look at like our antioxidant list, um, you know, uh, they are going to be foods that are super rich in color and vitamins. So vitamin C is actually an antioxidant. Um, vitamin uh, D, vitamin E, vitamin K, especially vitamin E and vitamin K, all of those are really powerful antioxidants, vitamin A a little bit. Um, and then in addition to that, what gives fruits and vegetables their color are these things called phytochemicals, right? Um, so phytochemicals are uh, these little chemicals that actually are just acting as antioxidants, like right, like lycopene, which is spelled with a Y, by the way. Uh, but lycopene or hesperidin or you know glutathione. Uh, K I can never pronounce this word. Uh, Cathachin, I think is what it is. But that's what's found in green tea. Green tea that is a huge one, by the way. Um, uh, capsaicin, that is the spicy thing <laughs> that, that, you know, makes our mouth hurt when we're eating like peppers and stuff. Um, that actually is a really powerful antioxidant. Uh, turmeric, uh, curcurum or cur cur curcumin, uh, beta carotene is a big one. So all of the things that are giving certain foods their bright, vibrant colors are actually the same types of things that are really rich in antioxidants that are going to protect us from oxidative stress. So like, uh, yeah, there we go. Look at this. 
Uh, that's a great picture. I love this. I, I love like, you know, the sort of high school or middle school approach to biology lessons. I think it's great. Like this little guy wants to steal this electron, but this little guy is over here is like, nope. Bloop. <laughs> and he's going to keep it from happening. Um, so one of the best things you can do, guys, is uh, to, to combat cancer is to make sure that we are getting a diet that is rich in lots and lots and lots of various colors. Um, and that's one of the best tools that's honestly very easy at our disposal. This is actually why sometimes you will have cancer patients um, who will be big fans of like juicing uh, or they'll go on vegan diets. Do I believe that like veganism is what uh, cures cancer? Not personally, but I do know that like a vegan diet is super rich in vegetables. And I do know that vegetables do protect us from different types of cancers. Um, so that's definitely a big thing to consider. So that's kind of our big long explanation on what cancer is. Do you guys have any questions on that? Um, no, not really. No, no question. I should, yeah, Thomas, you, you've heard a, a good chunk of this before in nutrition, but um, hopefully a little bit of a different perspective today. <laughs> right, right on. Certainly more cartoon characters today. That's <laughs> I do have a question about the um the antioxidants. Yeah. So like coffee has antioxidants. Yeah, um, it does actually. Berries, stuff like that has antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So like obviously we we eat those daily, you know? So that's like very good, right? So like we're technically protecting our bodies daily, like from like stuff like that. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, like so much of our food has has antioxidants in it. Um I will say this. Here's the thing that we also know, right? Uh, an excess group of cells can also, you know, abdominal obesity, like we talked about, is bad for diabetes. And we also see an increased risk of cancer right. amongst obese individuals because, like, you know, fat is one of the places we like to store stuff. It's where we store fat, but it's also like where we like the, you know, whenever I, you know, like I said earlier, your body doesn't know what to do with something, it will often just like shove it in a group of tissues so they can just stay there forever um because your body can't really get rid of it you know which by the way is a good thing when it's like a virus you know <laughs> like that's what the vaccine is right um yeah. it's like the information for the virus and your body's like all right great hold on to that forever um that's what's so weird about biology that i never think about like if you've ever like accidentally eaten this is so gross but if you've ever actually eat, eat, accidentally eaten like a parasite or something um for the most part your body will destroy it but it'll kill it and then it keeps it around forever. Nothing can actually like get really out of your body once it's in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, unless it does get filtered by your kidneys and peed out. So, um, so would that, you say like um, to avoid those parasites, just like buy more like organic uh, stuff? Actually, that's probably more likely to give you a parasite. Oh, there. really? Damn, yeah. So how, how do you avoid that? Because <laughs> it won't die, you know? Honestly, yeah. don't worry about it. Don't don't, don't be okay. afraid of it. Uh, the, you're, I mean, think <laughs> This is where like you're you're covered in so many germs right now millions of oh definitely <laughs> you know what i mean like um this is my favorite gross biology fact uh on your eyelids right now both of you guys myself included oh no i'm about uh, to wash my eyes right now <laughs> is a strain of gonorrhea or no is it chlamydia i think it's chlamydia there's a strain of like the the std yeah uh, there's a strain of that of that oh, virus shit that lives on your eyelashes and it's you have it every day and you wipe it it takes about a teaspoon of water a day to wipe it away um i think it's chlamydia hold on uh love. what if like um shampoo gets in my eyes most of the time but kill it <laughs> a little bit a little bit yeah, uh, but it will come back yeah, it is, yeah it is chlamydia um so it's actually it, it's not a big deal but like the only reason you know the, the reason i'm talking about that is like in developing countries where they don't have access to like clean drinking water yeah. um it'll sometimes like get into their eyes because they can't you know wash it away um part of the reason why my roommates and i all work to provide people with as much clean water on this planet as possible thirstproject.org yeah. everybody go check it out uh <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Sochi I did that. Uh, <laughs> so 
Um, <laughs> it's already recorded, man. You're about to upload that. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> then no, you're not gonna peel through all these videos. You know what? Just edit it. Just bleep that out real quick. You know? Yeah, and right. <laughs> um but yeah so so don't worry about that like but but i mean that's the thing right like the more often you can get antioxidants into your diet the better but go back to the coffee conversation so coffee has some antioxidants in it not not one of the best you know but it's it's decent right um it has some antioxidants in it so does that mean that coffee fights cancer maybe but think about how often people drink their coffee they often drink it with lots of milk and lots of sugar, which those things aren't necessarily cancer causing until they cause an excess in body weight because they're very high in calories. And then suddenly you have like abdominal obesity because you're drinking like a 600 calorie coffee every single day, you know, from Starbucks. Um, And now it's like, oh, well, abdominal obesity is associated with cancer. So you know, so yes is the pure answer. You know, like, yes, coffee beans have antioxidants in them, right? But does that mean that co- we don't want to necessarily frame it that way because that is something that would probably lead to a misinterpretation. Yeah, and then probably people are going to like overconsume coffee and then they'll be yeah. like having issues, especially if, like, if they don't know how to remove all those sweeteners and stuff like that you know and there exactly. you go drinking and, calories and here's the thing fat. now suddenly all somebody goes oh okay well i'll just use an artificial sweetener and those have absolutely been linked to cancer um again yeah, I need to lay are, off on those. <laughs> what's that i'm like i need to lay off on those <laughs> i'd certainly would i'm i'm not gonna go around like you know I, the evidence is still somewhat sparse and honestly like it's it's actually again here's how here's how i like to think about it Artificial sweeteners are man-made. So they, your taste buds, what, the way they work is they're chemically really similar to sugar. They look like a molecule of sugar uh, on yeah. a chemical level. So when they hit your taste buds, they trick your taste buds into making a signal in your brain that says, this is sweet, um, but it has zero calories because it's not food. So then it gets into your digestive system and your digestive system's like, that's not food. For the most part, it's going to go straight through the filtration system, it's going to go straight to your, it's going to get peed out. Right. Um, I'd say 99.999% of it, you know, most of it just gets peed straight out because it's not food. So your body's like, I have no reason to keep this. Right. Well, at the same time, if it ever gets like small enough to get stuck or embedded in another tissue, um, it's going to, if it gets into your actual bloodstream and stays there, it's going to get stuck. And it's a chemical that eventually could start oxidizing the things around it like anything else does exactly. um, and that's that's why i'm personally not thinking i will say when it comes to artificial sweeteners stevia is a natural option that's that's not a oh natural. really yeah oh, um, right. the only splenda. <laughs> what's that i'm like i use splenda most of the time yeah so splenda <clears throat> is um they're not the healthiest which one is splenda that's what they say it's the they, there isn't a uh chemical which one is that sucralose <clears throat> so yeah um sucralose it looks yeah kind of similar um but yeah i would say you'd be better off if you really do want to go artificial sweeteners um stevia is a good option okay. it's made from a plant the whatever stevia plant um and uh even like sugar alcohols can be better um, oh wow yeah, sugar alcohols, but be cautious with those because if you do too many of them, uh, <laughs> that's the thing yeah. in diabetic chocolates that make people get the runs. <laughs> yeah. So be careful with that. <laughs> I, I rarely get anything with that too. Like just no. rarely. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So when we're working with a, patient, a client who has cancer, right, our considerations, obviously a big one is excessive fatigue. Um, it's not so much the cancer that causes that, but the treatment for it, you know, a lot of times, like they are trying to destroy those cancer cells. So they are blasting them with radiation and chemotherapy and all these like different things, which unfortunately does affect your normal cells in the body. Right. Um, I heard somebody describe chemotherapy one time. It's like, it's basically a, a, a poison that kills, you know, all of the stuff around it. Um, but your cells are just strong enough to survive the poison. (laughs) 
but they're still going to get their butts kicked. Um, and that really is kind of how chemotherapy works. And so it leads to very excessive fatigue, um, which will result in diminished activity in the client. This is why muscle wasting is so very common. Um, weakness is common, right? A uh, decrease in lean muscle mass and a decrease in immune function. A lot of the white blood cells, which are their immune system, get destroyed. So when you're working with somebody who is either going through cancer or maybe just getting into remission or, you know, from it, they may have a decreased immune system. And so it's very important to wipe down the machines. It's very important to make sure that like, you know, they're staying like, healthy and, and, and everything like that, as well as watching for any weakness that they may have. Um, uh, but here's what's great about exercising, especially even if they are going through treatment, um, even just a little bit of physical activity can have positive benefits for when they get on to the other side. You know what I mean? Um, like once they get on the other side of cancer and they're like, you know, back to being normal, it's kind of like pregnancy, right? Like a lot of like pregnant women will exercise so that they have a little bit of endurance even after the pregnancy so they don't lose all of their strength, right? Um, same thing is true of like cancer patients, right? It's like if they can do a little bit of physical activity while they're going through treatment, yeah, it's definitely not going to be the same as, as if they, they weren't going through treatment, but they're, it's going to be easier to come back from losing 5% muscle mass compared to coming back from losing 20% muscle mass, you know? Yeah. Um, so depending on the severity, uh, if they can continually like exercise, it will have some really positive benefits, right? Retention of lean body mass is obviously a big one. Uh, also improved aerobic and anaerobic function. Uh, <clears throat> this mod, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about how metabolism works and how we develop like aerobic and anaerobic energy, but like you either produce energy anaerobically in the fluid of your cells, or you produce energy aerobically in the mitochondria of the cells, right? And so those are our two main areas that we produce energy, and both of them require <clears throat> chemical reactions to take place. And so we need a lot of like enzymes. We have a lot of like enzymatic activities, we call it. And those enzymes are kicking off these chemical reactions. Well, those enzymes often get destroyed through... Um, the treatment for cancer. And so a lot of times um, they'll have decreased aerobic and decreased anaerobic function, which is why a lot of times you'll, you'll have like cancer survivors get super like short of breath, um, even though they're like in remission, you know, their endurance will be much lowered. And it's just because their body's just having a hard time keeping up, making enough energy um, to, to, you know, sort of like keep up with, with the, their need for how much energy they have, right? Um, so if they exercise, when you exercise, you produce more of those enzymes as a physiologic response to exercise, right? Um, that's how we build our endurance up. Yeah. So positive benefits there. It'll have a great effect on their mood and their self-esteem, which is absolutely huge. Um, I cannot state how important that stuff is because a lot of times like, you know, this can be a very hard time in someone's life. And so this will have very positive effects. And then in general, they're gonna have less fatigue, right? With more aerobic capacity, with, with you know more of those enzymes, they're gonna have the capacity for normal everyday life. You know, they're not gonna get exhausted doing <clears throat> you know, these, these small tasks anymore. So uh, it's very important for us to develop our clients like strength and endurance. You can see here, we are putting a lot of emphasis on the endurance side of things. Just like with a senior client, we were trying to keep them upright and walking for the rest of their life, right? Um, so clients who are in remission for cancer survivors, the goal should be to return to whatever level they were at pre-cancer, right? Um, we know that they're gonna have a decrease like, you know, balance in response to probably being less physically active for however long they were dealing with it. Um, and obviously losing muscle mass and things like that. We're gonna see uh, that they're gonna have decreased bone mass as well due to, again, less physical activity and that, that kills us, right? Um, so we're gonna go for you know, trying to improve their bone density. Um, and they are going to, you know, experience like muscle wasting. So we are going to try to, um, you know, deal with that by building as much muscle as possible. When it comes to flexibility, we like static and active stretches here. Uh, SMR can be used, but sometimes, um, 
with uh, cancer treatment, it can thin out the capillaries and make them more susceptible to rupture, um, which means they bruise easier, right? Cancer patients will often bruise much, much, much easier. So foam rolling uh, can be used if there's no complications, but keep an eye on it um, due to that increased risk of, of bruises, you know? Um, Cardiorespiratory training, we're gonna start with stage one. Honestly, like we're gonna keep uh, this intensity, you know, almost below stage one, actually. Like really are try like the, you will notice first cancer patient you ever work with guys, um, you will really notice like their endurance is just bottomed out through the floor. And so a lot of times this is like not even zone one, it's it's below it, which would be a normally like a warm up for someone. Their heart is fine. Their heart can keep up, but they don't have the enzymes necessary to, to produce the energy. So because they're not producing enough energy, you will notice that they'll get like lactic acid buildup really, really quickly. And they'll just start breathing like crazy because that's what your body does when it's trying to process lactic acid. Um, but because it can't do it effectively, right? They're just making more. So then they breathe harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. So um, it's fine. Um, you know, you just probably need to give them plenty of rest and, and, you know, keep the intensity relatively low so that they can stay ahead of that curve. Uh, and then we love core and balance training. You know, again, their balance is going to be very diminished. So we definitely want to work on that. So mode, uh, treadmill walking is going to be big, uh, stationary cycling, rower, low impact aerobics, all the normal stuff, right? This isn't a, this isn't a, uh, blood pressure problem. Uh, it is, so we don't have to worry about like, you know, breath holding, although they shouldn't hold their breath because shortness of breath is such a common problem. Um, this isn't a, uh, musculoskeletal disorder. We're not worried about the impact really for the most part, you know, um, obviously they they are more susceptible to bruising. So we gotta be cautious of that. They do have decreased balance. So we gotta be cautious of that. But for the most part, movement wise, we can do all the normal stuff here, guys. Um, frequency three to five days per week, totally normal there. Intensity is 50 to 70% of heart rate reserve. So this is going to be based on whatever their resting heart rate is. And that's definitely going to be much lower. I mean, we normally see like 65 to 75% is zone one. So we are only going from like what is normally considered a warm up zone at 50% to halfway between the first zone. That's pretty low intensity. And that is good because that can help us build up our endurance. Um, I definitely will say, like I've worked with a couple clients in cancer remission and, uh, or even going through treatment currently. And yeah, like, it's just always very good. I used to always keep like an extra chair. This is another example of when I would keep a chair with me, uh, throughout my sessions, just so that my client could just be like, she would get exhausted. She would take a seat, um, and, and kind of relax and stuff. Um, duration 15 to 30 minutes. We're going to keep that duration relatively short. Um, lack of endurance and such. Uh, regular assessments are totally fine, by the way. Push, pull, overhead squat, single leg squat. You can do single leg uh, squat if it's tolerated. If they don't have the balance for it, then you can just do a single leg balance. Um, flexibility, SMR if it's tolerated, but then primarily focusing on static and active stretches. Uh, resistance training, you'll notice we're going one to three sets. We're keeping the reps relatively high, um, but like obviously we're not going all the way up to 20. Uh, so it's still somewhat low repetitions, um, but uh, it's sort of on like the, the upper, upper third, I guess, is what I would say, um, 10 to 15. So that way they can, you know, they don't have to like get into a position where they are running out of endurance, but they can also lift relatively heavy to build some muscle mass. I personally like 10 to 12 um, and then two to three days per week. Be cautious about, you know, avoid heavy lifting in the initial stages. Their proprioception is going to be a little bit thrown off. So if you lift really heavy, they might, um, they might uh, move in a way that they, you know, they might be like, oh yeah, no, I've deadlifted before, but then all of a sudden they just don't have the neurologic control anymore. So their form is really bad and they can put themselves at risk. So be cautious with heavy lifting in the beginning, but then like, you know, once you start to kind of continue working with that, as long as like their form is good, yeah, go for it, you know? Uh, and you may need to start with as little as five minutes of exercise. If they really, if that chemo and radiation absolutely wrecked their endurance, they may start literally with about five minutes. Um, I would do, I remember, uh, you know, this client that I had when I was living up in Portland, she was like, you know, it was such a bummer. She like 
was in remission she was coming back and then like you know cancer came back and she was in and out for for a little over a year there constantly but uh when she was going through treatment i mean this woman was like a battle axe super tough and uh every now and then she would just need like a minute she would just like she would sit she'd recover for a minute or two um and then she would get back on her feet and work and then she would just need to sit you know uh and it would be like about every five or six minutes she would just take you know a minute or two to kind of recover and, and relax um <clears throat> so that is uh cancer clients uh any questions on that before we move into lung stuff um no cool yeah. all right let's do the lung stuff so uh lung disease uh obviously this could be talking about lung cancer but uh, we are actually looking at sort of the two different versions of lung disease here. Uh, again, you know how much I, I said this, I think at the beginning of the mod, but like scientists, we love, they love to get stuff down into twos, you know? <laughs> so, um, chronic lung disease is any and all the conditions that cause a uh, decrease in individual's ability to bring in oxygen. Right. So even just like, I mean, Eddie, you had, uh, you saying you, you had COVID earlier this year, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Like you, your your lungs basically the what it is as a uh, as like a novel coronavirus, right? Is that it basically gets into your lungs and it fills it with like different types of fluids and makes it very difficult for oxygen to move from one area to another. That area being inside your lungs to inside your bloodstream. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's stopping that process from happening, which is why you need like a ventilator um, in you know really extreme cases. For sure. <clears throat> so um, there's going to be two different types of lung disease that we're going to see. We're going to see restrictive and obstructive. Okay. So restrictive lung disease is where uh, the condition of the fibrous lung tissue loses its ability to expand. A really good example of this is what's known as like cystic fibrosis. And it's where these fibers actually build up on the lungs and prevent oxygen from being able, you know, prevent the lungs from being able to expand properly. It basically gets this like really kind of nasty tissue there uh, that kind of prevents that expansion. And it's, it's like, um, it's honestly similar to hardened arteries. It's just that this is taking place in the tubes of our lungs. So that can be really, you know, hard to deal with uh, for a lot of people, right? Um, and then there's also like obstructive lung disease, which is really similar, but this is a condition of altered airflow in the lungs because there's mucus and other materials that are absolutely covering those blood vessels. So in one, we lost elasticity and in the other, we have something like COPD. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder uh, and is where they experience decreased airflow into the body because their lungs are filled with junk, right? So if you look here, this is a normal, healthy, like, you know, tube, right? Uh, and then here you can see because of inflammation, that tube is like swelling like this, and that's preventing stuff from being able, like air from being able to move down there. Or we will see materials that are actually like covering it, right? Uh, <clears throat> so I'm sure you guys have seen a million of these pictures before. You know, I'm, I know that people always pull these pictures up to like scare people. Um, they look at like the difference between like a normal healthy lung uh, and like a smoker's lung. There was a really great, uh, he just passed away the other day, but Norm MacDonald used to have this really funny joke that was talking about how he's like, they always try to show you, uh, like they're always trying to scare you away from smoking by being like, this is a smoker's lung. And you're like, oh God, it's gross and disgusting. And then they're like, versus here's a normal lung. And I'm like, oh God, it's gross and disgusting. <laughs> um, I always thought that was like hilarious, but you can see here, right? Like this is literally where, you know, the materials from smoking, the, the, you know, if you look at them, um, we show like, you know, as these kind of expand here, where's the video? Is that not the video? I literally, I've seen that video before. I know it's a video. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. 
Here is running air through a normal healthy lung versus like a smoker's lung. Same amount of air and everything. And you can just see like, you know, it's, it's having sort of a decreased uh, sort of capacity there in comparison, right? Um, that's not what we wanna see. <laughs> um, those materials cannot expand the way that they are sort of supposed to, right? So that is going to, you know, be what's really bad as, for us, right? It's where there's basically tar and all kinds of other materials, which are chemicals, which going back to our cancer conversation, starts to make a lot of sense why lung cancer is so common, right? It's literally just an area where there's a bunch of stuff and you're the one surrounding it. So those tissues get compromised. So asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, right? Um, all of those are really good examples of COPD where like fluid or mucus or other materials start covering the tubes that are supposed to like allow gas to move into and out of our lungs. And what's supposed to happen, um, what is supposed to happen is that the end of your lungs end in these little like, you know, these little sacs here, right? It kind of looks like this, um, where like branches down into these tubes and, you know, if those tubes are covered, you're, you're, you know, in big trouble, but like that branch is small and small. And eventually it ends in these little popcorn things here, right? These little like sacs. Well, those are called your alveoli. Um, Uh, and that alveoli can get damaged. Like here's like what they're supposed to, this is where if we chopped one of them open, this is what they look like on the inside. Uh, and that's what increases the surface area. There's blood vessels that kind of run throughout this whole area here. And that is what allows like oxygen to transmit. But if you, you know, because this is like a lot of really thin walls on the inside of here, if you increase the pressure too much, it can break or stretch out the walls. And that's gonna decrease your surface area. And when you decrease the surface area, right? Like here's a good example, right? That all the walls burst, right? Um, and so like now there's just this much, you know, there's one big wall around the outside that can transmit oxygen way less compared to having lots of little tiny walls all on the inside. This is all about surface area here. The less surface area you have, the less exposure your blood is going to, to have, right? Uh, I know it's a very weird analogy, but honestly, think of it this way. Um, you know, if you had a bucket of paint or a bucket of blood and you had to paint like one wall, that's however much surface area. But now imagine if that wall had like a, a you know, a, a bunch of texture in it, right? Like it comes out this way and that 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 way, right? Well, now you've got three, four, five times as much surface area. And that's great. That means there's more places where oxygen can be exposed. In COPD, that's not the case anymore. We have less surface area. That means oxygen can't even get into our bloodstream. And that's why they're gonna experience shortness of breath like crazy. So when you have any of this lung disease stuff, the big thing we're paying attention to is we are watching for clients who have shortness of breath. So this is frequently associated <clears throat> with cardiovascular disease, right? With restricted lung capacity, individuals will often experience a more sedentary lifestyle, which often results in chronic heart disease. And that's a bummer, right? So like, as somebody uh, becomes less physically active, uh, they then start to experience like heart problems, which only makes all of this worse, right? Um, we also need to be cautious that uh, upper extremity exercise will often result in our clients getting fatigued a lot faster. Um, so like, uh, that's one of the things that we got to watch for. This is why we're doing upper body dysfunction on Monday. Um, so they'll experience what we call dyspnea, which is the fancy term for shortness of breath. Um, but clients will experience shortness of breath frequently due to like upper body exercise. So they'll be doing like shoulder presses and they'll hold their breath. Um, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, they'll get real, <sighs> Ah, super out of breath and stuff. Push-ups are a really good example. Rows are a really good example. So this is where you actually remember we talked about like a peripheral heart action where you go upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body. We did that for our clients with blood pressure problems because that's little blood pressure reps. We are actually going to do that again with 
clients who have like COPD or restrictive lung disease, not because it actually makes the disease better, but it just allows them to continue exercising without getting out of breath. If you do upper body after upper body after upper body after upper body over and over and over again, eventually they start to experience really bad shortness of breath because like upper body exercises are harder to breathe. I mean, it's just difficult to breathe when you're doing push-ups for some people. Um, so they may experience shortness of breath during that and we gotta be cautious of it. Um, sometimes they'll be on supplemental oxygen. They'll have like an air tank or something like that. Uh, and then one thing that we see is very common is that we will see significant muscle wasting uh, and low body weight due to uh, lung disease. So this is often where we see like, um, muscle wasting, your, your muscles live off oxygen. I mean, it's, it's a very, you know, big thing. So you'll see like this kind of very overly thin here, right? Um, that often happens because the, the muscles need oxygen to be able to survive. And because they're not getting as much oxygen delivery, they're just like, all right, well, we got to get rid of some of this tissue, you know? Um, so obviously some very negative effects, right? Decreased gas exchange due to the mucus or other substances that block the airways. Uh, decreased ventilation due to alterations in posture and alterations in like your lungs ability to expand. So now we have screwed up our ability to breathe in two different ways, right? One of them is that we can't expand our lungs enough to create areas of low pressure to drive oxygen in. And we've also covered the airways, which means oxygen can't move from one side of the wall to the other. So like two ways that this is bad for us. Um, uh, that often leads to low levels of exercise, which again is not great for our heart. And it can often lead to short, shortness of breath due to those very shallow breathing patterns. Um, but we do know that exercise has a positive effect. It's a good way for us to sort of combat all of this and fight it, right? Uh, we'll see improved functional capacity by just increasing someone's tolerance for that uncomfortable nature of exercise. Again, exercise is inherently uncomfortable. That's kind of the point, you know, is that it's stress. So that your body goes, oh God, I need to get better at this, you know? Um, so uh, we are going to see an improved capacity that way uh, in our clients, thanks to the fact that exercise is kind of tough and a little uncomfortable. Uh, it'll decrease their shortness of breath symptoms, which is really good. It will decrease like, you know, how much shortness of breath they're experiencing because you are going to build up some of those enzymes. You're going to make us more efficient at using oxygen. We're going to strengthen the diaphragm, all kinds of really positive stuff. And then there are psychological benefits as well. Increased positivity in the mood uh, and an internal locus of control. Um, that one there, uh, we haven't used that term in a while, but internal locus of control is the belief that you are in control, not external forces. One of the things that really sucks about cancer and lung disease, guys, is that people will start to feel like they are trapped in their own body. And that sucks, right? I mean, the same thing is true. I've, I've talked to like my obese clients, right? It feels like they're a passenger in their own life uh, sometimes where they're like, you know, I'm just going through the day to day. Um, but exercise, anxiety. what's that? Anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety. Right. But exercise is so good for that because it is something it's like, look, you are master and commander, you know, you are in control of things. That's, we call it, that's called an internal locus of control. And it is one of the, one of my favorite things to talk about that has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, really. Uh, yeah. but I could go on and on and on about it. I always encourage people. I challenge, I, I, I always challenge people. Whenever I hear someone say, "Ugh, bad stuff always happens to me. I will almost never let someone get away with saying that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good though. Yeah. Because that is a, you're, you, you believe in an, that's what's called an external locus of control. You believe that there are forces outside in the world that are controlling everything about you. But we have an immense amount of control over our life. Don't get me wrong. We were all dealt different hands, you know? Like, I don't exactly come from a very wealthy family. Um, you know, my dad didn't give me a million dollar loan uh, to start a real estate empire and eventually run for president. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, but that doesn't mean that like, you know, through like 
you know, hard work and, and things like that, that I can't take control of, of my life. Right. Um, and that's what exercise, I think exercise is great for that. It gives you something that you have direct control over. I definitely agree. Yesterday. So remember I told you about having that vertigo, right? Oh Two yeah. Years ago. Mm-hmm. So yesterday I, I trained, I, I was, I was scared, you know, yeah. I was like, what if I feel this way again or whatever? Yeah. And I, I suffer from anxiety like most of my life. So sure. uh, I've just never had it like just, you know, recently until now, like, you know, they worry the hell out of me, right? Cause it's just, it's just constantly worried. You. Like, oh, like right. I just don't wanna, you know, you always think like something's really wrong with you, but you're like, you look back, you realize look, man, like you come so far, like, you know what I mean? Like you've gotten from like, obviously from the photo that you're seeing right now, <laughs> you came from that way to now you're sure. Sure. super healthy. Nothing's wrong with you. Uh, it was just like, you know, just the handstand, right? It's just yeah. kind of, you know, maybe I'm gonna just lay off of it just for now, just because it's like, you know, backtracking my shoulder days, which I don't want. And then, um, dude, like in the beginning, I had like crazy brain fog. Like I just couldn't concentrate. I was just excessively right. worrying. And like my friend would just look at me. It's like, bro, you look worried, bro. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know, dude. And then like, he, thanks to him, he pushed me. Like he, we're doing pushups and then he added weight on my pushups, right? Which normally I would always do, but I didn't want to that day though. I mean, yeah. yesterday, I didn't want to at all. I'm like, nah, what if I pass out or something? <laughs> Sure. you know and then he was like nah bro you can't think that way he's like just just think of it as like all right this is like if you can't do this that you're gonna just f yourself up and you really have to like be in that um survival mode right yeah and you are master dude, like, commander you're the driver of the wheel you know exactly a master of my brain so like my brain was literally <laughs> focusing on the weight instead of focusing on uh, different things and then it just went away yeah and then i was literally having a good workout after that love that man it's yeah. easy to forget. It's so easy to forget that we're the ones in control. Exactly. Yeah. It really Cause is. Because there are so many things that we are not in control of, but we are in control of our response to those things, you know? Yeah. Um, which is where, you know, like that's that's where the world's best apologies always come from. <laughs> you know? yeah. like, where you're like, God, you lose your temper and then you got to go back later. And you're like, I made an ass of myself. I'm going <laughs> to apologize, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um. I lost control, but now that I have it back, I'm realizing that I'm being irrational, you know, like, yeah. um, to use a very specific example, but you know, like, yeah, that's, it's, it's amazing what we're in control of. Um, so that's one of the best positive benefits of exercise. A lot of times it can feel like you're out of control when you feel trapped in your own body. Um, but exercise yeah. can kind of give our clients that back now when it comes to exercise prescription, like I said, this is kind of a surprising one. We're going to go back to those PHA circuits. The peripheral heart action is highly recommended for clients who have really bad shortness of breath and really bad uh, lung restriction problems because it just gives their upper body time to get back to neutral posture. While you're doing some leg stuff, they can open up the the diaphragm again. Um, They can kind of get some breath in. So we like all the regular cardio, elliptical trainers, treadmill, steppers, stationary cycling. I will say the rower disappears here. Um, no rowing machine for clients who have really bad dyspnea. Um, I mean, unless they work their way back up to it, you know, uh, but if they have like really bad shortness of breath, something where they are literally compressing their diaphragm and then like hunching, it's just, that's not going to help them breathe easier. Um, three to five days per week you will see here 40 to 60%. We're saying peak work capacity. So we are going to, you know, sort of get somebody on like a treadmill. This is where we do that VT test, right? And we get them up and it's like, heart rate is this, how you feel? And they're like, I feel good. Heart rate is this, how do you feel? I feel good. Heart rate is this, I'm starting to get a little out of breath, right? So you're going to like chart that out until your client is like, could not possibly do this any longer. And you're like, okay, that's a 10. Right. So you're going to work on like a four to six on that so that they can never get super, 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 super out of breath. Um, Yes, eventually we want to get to a place where we can work on cardio, um, but it's going to be a very, very, very long road for a client like this um, because they just don't have that capacity. Sometimes it's literally oxygen not getting in. So it's not a it's not a, a, a product of how hard they're working. It's a product of, you know, physics. Um, So work up to 20 to 45 minutes. Um, A lot of times it'll start very, you know, you'll get 10 minutes in and they will be huffing and puffing. Even if they, you know, they're like in a total normally body, you look at them and you're like, you know, they look like somebody who has plenty of endurance, but sometimes they'll be missing it. 
Uh, push, pull, overhead, squat, single leg, squat, single leg balance. It's not a neuromuscular problem. So these are all fine. I will say, be a little cautious about the pushing and the pulling. Again, like it can cause shortness of breath. Um, static, active, self myofascial release. Those are all fine. I get, but I will also say foam rolling, be careful with that. Uh, that can also cause shortness of breath because of the postures you got to get into. Uh, and you will notice we are going to drop the, the reps pretty low. Um, uh, not super low, but relatively low. And we're only going to do one set here. We're going to do like one set of maybe eight to 15 repetitions. Um, that is oftentimes where it will start. Eventually you can work your way out of that and give, you know, sort of work your way to normal routines as they build up their endurance. Um, but it will often start very, 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 very low. Um, that's about as low as the volume ever gets in the whole sort of course here. Uh, and it's literally just like a, an endurance problem, you know? So upper body exercise can cause that shortness of breath. So be careful with that. Uh, and just always allow for sufficient, uh, rest between sets. What's like the max, like just like as long as they catch your breath and they feel better or maybe like two minutes. Uh, yeah, I would say until they catch their breath and feel better. Okay. Um, it shouldn't be two minutes. What's weird is they actually catch their breath relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. I didn't even see it at this point. Um, they'll actually catch their breath relatively quick because it's not like um, it's not like they don't. It's just that they they're having a trouble like keeping up with the capacity. So once the exercise stops, you know they really start to get ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So let's take a look here. Uh, this is our client. Um, Tatiana, and she had breast cancer that is in remission. Um, I remember this. Deborah built this client. Uh, <laughs> Deborah was a client that I had who was super into like pole dancing, actually, which for the record is, you know, a hell of a type of exercise. Like, yeah, isn't that like a lot of strength? Dude, it's so much strength. Like I could, <laughs> that stuff, you know, and I love pull ups. <laughs> um, but yeah, so pole dancing, she likes to play tennis, uh, and she's a painter. She is currently a, she, she works, uh, she's a rocket scientist. She said that this is based on a friend of hers who worked over in, uh, Pasadena. Um, oh God, some aerospace thing over in Pasadena, but it is a generally very sedentary job sitting at a computer like four to six hours a day. Uh, her goal was to increase her energy, get her upper body strength back, obviously, because she wants to dance, uh, and get her cardio endurance back for playing tennis. Uh, she's 37 years old, 145 pounds, five foot eight. Um, when we did the overhead squat, we saw the arms fall forward as well as a low back arch. Uh, during the push pull, we saw shoulders elevate and then the low back arch. So we are seeing a little bit of like tight erector spinae, tight hip flexors. And we're seeing a lot of like tightness in like the lats and things like that, which makes a lot of sense. Um, definitely some lat tightness here in a client, you know, she's doing a lot of like pull up action, right? Um, so uh, we are going to do the max push up test to build, you know, she wants to build up her upper body endurance again. And we're also going to do the dead hang assessment. Uh, which we threw in there as a special one. Uh, so we're going to see how long she can hang from a pull-up bar and build up that endurance, right? For cardiovascular training, we're going to work our way up to 30 minutes on the treadmill three times a week at, like we said, 50 to 70% of her heart rate reserve. She should be able to hold a conversation the whole time, but that's going to be the limiting factor there is not so much her heart rate as much as it is her breathing rate. Uh, flexibility training, good Lord. Lats, pecs, traps, and then a little bit of hip flexors and TFL, but we are definitely going to spend a lot of time busting up the upper body. Um, she's just got a lot of tightness up there. Uh, strength training two to three, two times per week for one to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions using a slow tempo because that slow tempo is going to be associated with that, those calisthenics. Um, we're going to focus on stabilization. We're going to do a lot of TRX. Uh, and then we're going to do when it comes to, um, uh, uh, the lower body, we're going to focus on like frontal plane movements so she can get better at that like lateral action for tennis. So it is going to be a lot of like side shuffling, hip abductions and things like that. We are going to avoid super heavy lifting and we're going to have a chair available in case she ever gets super exhausted. Uh, and we are probably going to do, um, you know, uh, lots of like total body workouts and things like that, which are just very good for endurance. Um, apparently this is actually 
according to Deborah, like a very realistic version of this. She sent this to her friend and she thought it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which I love. I love the idea of this woman in freaking Pasadena who's like working on like rockets and stuff and then like leaves class and goes or leaves leaves work and goes straight over to like a freaking, you know, pole dancing like aerials class. That stuff is so impressive. That is like, crazy. Yeah. I have a feeling I'm going to get a lot of pole dancers in my programs. Like once oh. they start promoting calisthenics and stuff like that. You're a calisthenics like... guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I watched it. I saw a thing yesterday. It was just like a GIF on like my Instagram feed, um, mm -hmm. and it was like a uh, pole dancing, sliding down legs. Oh my! I'm gonna find this. It was nuts. It was like somebody who was wrapped around with just the legs. Ah literally like legs only yeah it was Whoa. something like this um oh, something shit. like this here How? and then th yeah so that's impressive enough as it is but then they like let everybody in the class right all of them let go at the same time and they like fell down but then they caught themselves just above the floor <laughs> like, wow so then they re and like and like stop like six inches above the ground. And I was like, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. <dude. laughs> it's wild. Um, well, that's it, fellas. Uh, those are all the populations in the book. How y'all feeling? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, definitely interesting. That's the so uh it's very important. This, this is one of the like the reasons why I didn't want to like train just any client like especially if i didn't have my certification because i was like wait i don't know how to deal with these people with like these conditions yeah so this really really helps out love that yeah thomas what about you yes it was fine fair Pretty cool well guys uh we're meeting up on monday you know the drill 9 a.m for the morning session 6 p.m for the evening and uh yeah i will uh i'll see you then all right brad Sounds good. Appreciate the lecture. Of course. All right, man. See you guys. See you later, fellas. Later.